Thanks, David, and for my goods, Minister. Um, certainly a lot going on, I think, at Irish, European and international level in, in water. Anyone who's keeping an eye on, on developments, it's very clear water has come into the spotlight uh, with climate and droughts and floods and, and all sorts of terrible events really happening around the world. Um, so, let me get my... Uh, post on. So today, uh, as Emer mentioned, we've, we've published our, our latest water quality report. So um, I'm going to just give a little introduction. Sometimes when we're talking about water quality, everybody has something slightly different in their head. So I'm going to just go through very quickly what we're talking about when we're talking about water quality. Um, a quick overview then of how is water quality in Ireland, the overall status, and then the latest data, and just a little bit more detail on those headline figures that Emer spoke about. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit then about the pressures on water quality and some of the evidence evidence base we have, as Emer said, that we have a lot of science now and knowledge and uh, data and tools to help us support measures and action. Um, so I'll speak to those a little bit and some of us with in mind to our, our session this afternoon on agriculture. Obviously there is a lot of focus on agriculture, um, so I'll speak to that a little bit um, and some of the action needed. So what am I talking about when I talk about water quality? So there's two elements. How healthy are the living things? Um, and that's these biological quality elements, plants, insects, fish, so our ecologists are out looking at these things in rivers and lakes and estuaries. And, um, uh, and that's it. So it's important to remember like, that water quality, it's the whole ecosystem uh, and, and uh, an ecosystem approach and not just, a, I suppose, a chemical water quality, uh, the cleanliness of the water. And then there's how healthy is their living space, so the supporting conditions that are enabling these wildlife to thrive in the water. So that's the physiochem elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, ammonia, temperature, oxygen. So there's parameters that the local authorities take and sample and, and bring back into the labs. Um, and then the hydromorphological elements, which are things like flow and quantity and the physical conditions, so the habitat that the, the creatures are living in. And when you have all of these working together and pull all the results, we get the overall ecological status. And that's those five classifications from uh, excellent, good, moderate, poor and bad, the, the famous red dots, which thankfully are, are declining. We also get asked quite a bit about the monitoring and how often we monitor. We have an extensive monitoring program, very high level of coverage across the country. Um, so the biology, the rivers and lakes are typically done once every three years. So every three years we have a full cycle of, of all the catchments. Um, the physiochem then can vary, but it's multiple times a year usually, between four and eight times usually for the nutrients. So we have annual data uh, regularly. Um, but for some of the kind of hazardous type chemicals, they're done maybe once in every six year cycle. Um, and then the hydromorphology similarly is done when the ecologists are out, so that's once every three years. So when we publish our report, it's usually an update on the overall status every three years, but it can have up to six years of data, but always the most current data in it. So just to fry everyone's head, because I know it causes confusion sometimes with the reports. So what's it all about? And just a little recap again, I know most of you will be familiar with this, but what are we trying to achieve for water quality, our objectives? And the aim is to achieve the, the blue and the green, the high and the good ecological status, where we have clean, healthy, resilient, diverse ecosystems functioning normally. Um, and what we're trying to do is protect those, as everyone will know. When you hit the moderate, poor or bad, you have an increasing deterioration and severity of, of deterioration in the ecosystem and the diversity in that and the water quality over overall um, altered ecosystem, impaired function, and reduced diversity and resilience. And resilience is really important now, you know, in the, it has always been, but in the context of climate, I think even more so, and we're trying to improve those. So how is water quality in Ireland? Well, as you know, we have today's report, but we had published the overall full assessment there last November, so since we last all met here in Salt Hill. So just to show that the chart on the left, as the Minister referred to, we have, uh, well, we, we, we take the positive with 54% of water bodies which are in high or good ecological status. So a little over half are meeting their objective, but obviously we want to get that, that whole chart to, to blue or green. So we have 46% which are not in good ecological status. It is important to note if you look at the map in the middle, which is all the surface water bodies, you know, water, there are water quality issues widespread across the whole country. You know, we speak of regional issues with some of the nutrients, but there are issues everywhere, really, in terms of the different types of pressures that can impact on water quality. 
So I'm going to go just through some of the indicators now. Uh, the report is available online. It's fairly short and, and concise, so do take a look at it. Um, the first one and one of the big main indicators we have is the river uh, biology, which is the Q values, the invertebrates. So you can see that the top line there, that's this year's results added in uh, on a rolling three-year cycle. And you can see that the last about three bars, there's been very little change and very little movement uh, in these Q values. So that's why we're saying really that there's no overall improvement in it. We need to see the, um, that those blue and green lines move uh, up, up the way to get improvements in our water quality. Um, just to give some of the figures, we in 2022, we monitored 671 river water bodies. That's in or around a third of the monitored sites. Uh, 84 improved and 77 declined. So there's a very slight net improvement, but it's very small. And as I say, when you add in all the other elements, when we go towards ecological status, the chances are some of those will drop down in terms of overall results. So no major change, but there is a small bit of good news in there, um, which is these famous Q5 pristine sites. The minister referred to it. We have been lost down from 500 to, I think, 20 in our 2018 report. You know, so very severe decline. And these are the repositories of all those biodiverse species. So three more in the 2022 data, uh, which brings us up to 35 site, so uh, some progress there. So on to the famous nutrients and the nitrogen and phosphorus in rivers. So this first map, which I can just about see, is the nitrates. So you can see the uh, regional distribution. These are the three-year averages because it gives an overall sense of you know, what, the, what, what the ecology is, is, the conditions are for the ecology over three years. You can see we have these hot spots in the south and southeast, which we've been highlighting. And that's because nitrate is primarily a problem on free-draining soils, the most intensive agriculture, um, and uh, that that's where we're seeing those problems. Uh, if we look at the phosphorus map then, kind of similarly, it's three-year averages. Um, and again, there's a regional variation, a uh, little bit of a different distribution to the nitrate. You can see that band running across from Limerick across into the southeast and then north of Dublin and up around the border area where we have freely draining soil. So phosphorus comes, the nitrogen mostly comes from, uh, I'll speak to a little bit later, but mostly from agriculture. The phosphorus is about 50-50 nitrogen and phosphor, or, sorry, agriculture and wastewater. Water. Um, but in terms of the agricultural impact, it's on those poorly draining soils where the phosphorus runs over land when there's rainfall and gets into our water courses. Um, so again, we have more to do there. And just in, in summary, 40% uh, of the sites have, of river sites have unsatisfactory nitrate levels. And that's this, there isn't an environmental quality standard for nitrate, but there's indicative standards you know, of what would, what's needed to achieve good water quality in rivers. Um, and then for phosphorus, it's 28% of the sites have unsatisfactory phosphate, um, and that's above the 0.035 milligrams, which is a standard. So, you know, we have a quarter of the sites aren't meeting the standard there for phosphorus. So we've included then some annual information on the nitrates and the, the, the time series. Um, so this is, and we've included national and regional for the nitrates and phosphates in the report. So again, if you're interested, take a look at the, the detail in the report. So this is the series from uh, 2010 through to 2022. And just to highlight a couple of little things, uh, or a couple of things, the 2022 data is higher than 2021, the average nitrogen, nitrate concentration in rivers. And there has been a little bit of a narrative out there that nitrates are dropping. Um, so I suppose it's, it's a pity to see the, the upturn. But some of the reason, I think, for that narrative is that back in 2018 and 2019, we had very sharp increases in nitrate, um, which followed the drought. And the advice at the time was to put out fertilizer and hope the grass would grow, um, which that, that advice has been amended since, but we kind of saw a flush through of nitrate then at that time. So we had quite a large spike. So for a year or two, it looked like they were kind of coming back down, but it was probably more of a readjustment. So the nitrate levels have uh, gone up nationally and in all the regions in 2022. <coughs> Um, just to pull out one of the regions, which is the one we, we talk about the most, the southeast region. So you can see immediately that the overall line is significantly higher, and that's the average concentrations in the southeast are just too high. And that yellow dotted line is the kind of level, again, a, a kind of an indicator level of what you would need to achieve good water quality in your estuaries and meet the standards in the estuaries. So we are above the line on average uh, in the southeast region. Um, and again, you can see that we have increased in 2022 versus 2021 there. 
so I think, oh yeah, and just to show the trend upwards, and that, that value in 2022, both nationally and the southeast, is higher than if you take out the 2018, 2019, it's above all the previous values as far back as 2010. So um, it, it, it's a, an increase. Um, so that's the summary in the report. The levels in the southeast are too high, and that the nitrates have increased between 21 and 2022. Uh, there's a similar series of graphs then with all the regions and for phosphate. Um, I haven't included them here just time-wise, but the phosphate levels um, are a little bit, there's more fluctuation and variation nationally and regionally, but kind of certainly over the last few years, generally a stable, sort of a stable uh, level, um, but they will need to come down. Uh, in order to deliver the biology and the biological improvements and ecological, we need to get those nitrogen, nitrogen and phosphate levels down. Um, we sp to speak about nitrogen in the estuaries a lot because that's where it really has that impact. So this is the um, uh, map shows the three-year average data for the dissolved inorganic nitrogen. Um, and that's the, the map is showing the level of exceedance above the threshold. It's sort of a, a complicated assessment with salinity uh, in it as well, or a more complicated assessment. So um, there are the results there. And again, you can see that band right along the south coast where the levels are too high. And overall, we have 20% of the water bodies uh, of our estuarine, estuarine and coastal water bodies unsatisfactory for nitrogen. Um, and the majority of those, as I said, are along the south and southeast coast. And, you know, you get the, I think I was asked this morning about, you know, what, what is the impact? And you get these kind of algae blooms and sea lettuce kind of washing up on the estuaries and um, kind of unsightly and a nuisance and a real indication. Uh, an indicator that you've uh, an impacted water body there. So just in summary, in terms of the indicators, uh, as I said, no significant change in the biology. We're just not seeing the, the dial moving enough to start seeing uh, improvements. The nitrate concentrations are unsatisfactory in 40% of rivers and 20% of estuaries. And they have gone up, as I mentioned, in both the rivers and groundwaters uh, between 21 and 22. Phosphate levels too high in 28% of rivers and over a third of lakes, 36% of lakes, normally along the, the, the border, along Monaghan Cavan, that direction there, we have those freely draining soils, but are generally stable. Um, and then the marine loadings, which again I haven't shown, were typically, un not unsurprisingly, higher in 2022 and 2021. So, sorry, quite a bit of bad news in all of that, uh, despite all the, the work that is going on out there. But um, that's the, the 2022. So I suppose how do we get into solutions and measures to address this? So there's, we mentioned there is a lot of science now and assessment available to, to look at that. So you'd be familiar with our pressures chart, which is the characterization exercise to look at um, what, what is impacting on the water bodies. And this chart is, because uh, we sometimes get asked that, going, well, how do you know it's this and not X and not Y? Or how do you know what's causing the problems and where they're coming from? So this chart is the water bodies that are at risk of not meeting their objective, of which there's about, there was 1,600, I think, at the time, and might, might be a little bit higher now. Um, so the, da the assessment is based on the, mo it's done up kind of water body scale uh, and scaled up. So it's the monitoring data, so you can see what's in the water, what's, what's the problem, and then an assessment of multiple data sets to see, well, what's going on in that catchment? What's the soil and geology? What's the agricultural activity? Wastewater treatment plants, septic tanks, forest repeat, whatever it is, where might the, the, the nutrients or whatever the issue is in the water uh, be coming from? And then we get back to this bar chart then when you scale it up. So water quality is impacted by a range of human activities um, and a water body can be impacted by one, one or more pressure types. That's important to remember. Some water bodies might have ag, uh, wastewater and maybe peat, for, just for example, all impacting on it. I can hear some sound, but I think you can all hear me okay, hopefully, yeah. Okay. So that's the pressures on it. So that gives us information about the types of sectors and what kind of action might be needed uh, to inform the measures. I mentioned the, that question of well, where did the nutrients coming from? How do you know it's agriculture and not wastewater? How do you know it's dairy and not tillage? These types of questions get asked, which is our fair questions. So that we have a source load apportionment model, which can um, look at the different nutrients and what the sources are and what the overall contribution is. Um, so again, it estimates the nutrient loads from the different sectors. So you can see the, the chart for nitrogen, the orange colour, just to look at the oranges and the greens, the orange colour is wastewater and the kind of greens and yellows are 
pasture and arable respectively. So, respectively. so you can see that most of nitrogen is coming from agricultural sources. Uh, whereas for phosphorus, you can see the bar there for wastewater is substantially higher, and it's about 50-50 in terms of source. So there's work to be done uh, in all sectors. And there's other contributors as well, which all need to be addressed. So we can use the information as well and, and the, the, the evidence we have to try and help inform policy and to try and target measures. The really important thing is, again, you'll all know, is that measures for water quality need to be targeted because the, the, the issues are specific to the water body. So we have, for example, the agricultural measures map, which shows the areas where nitrogen measures are needed or phosphorus measures are needed. So they're being used by ASAP um, and by, by LawPro and ASAP. Uh, they're used, I think they're been used to inform some of the, maybe the acre schemes as well, um, and they're being used to target the agricultural inspections. And the aim really is to go, well, let's look when we go out, you know, if you go out to a farm, look at the right thing and try and address the issue that will give the best result for water quality, um, you know, to get the, I suppose, the, the most, uh, the optimum solution, I suppose, the most economically um, sensible solution as well. Um, if, Two years ago, we were able to publish a nitrogen reduction uh, document, and that looked at what level of nitrogen reduction needs to come out of some of the catchments. I'm not going into the detail here. It's just really to give us a, a, a sense of what can be used to, um, to inform policy. So you can see again that the different shadings say how, give an indication of what catchments need the most uh, reductions in nitrogen losses. Um, and the Slaney and the Barrow there are up about 50%, but some of them are a good bit less than that. That's 2017 to 2019 averages, so we would hope to update that uh, with newer information when we have it. Um, and not to leave out wastewater again, we have um, in around 200 water bodies which are being impacted by wastewater and where there are the significant pressures, that's the distribution of those. So again, you can target, well, we, uh, EPA has been calling for Ishgar and, you know, to target those wastewater plants or the drainage networks that are causing those impacts on water quality in order to deliver the improvements that we need. Um, I won't go into too much detail. People will be familiar with the, the PIP maps. There's a lot of detail, but again, it's really to go. We can really get down to water body scale and, and field and farm scale nearly in terms of where are the risky areas. They're an indicator of risk. They're not a, an assessment of where exactly it needs to be ground through to. But you can see, um, now you won't be able to see that. I'm not particularly expecting you to look at it in detail, but the very purple areas are areas where you have a higher risk of nitrogen leaching to the soil and the lighter areas less of a risk. So you really need to get there at nitrogen reductions in those purple areas. Um, similarly for the phosphorus, um, you can see the blue lines are the water bodies and you can look at where are the flow paths, where is, if you get rain running over land, where is it going to come out into a water course? And that's where you need that interception measure. So rather than saying you need to put buffer strips right along this whole river, it's like you can really pinpoint and target where the area is that might give the best results. So again, it's trying to use the science to inform um, solutions and, and outcomes. Um, so that's it. I think I've touched probably on most of these. We won't get the water quality improvements we want uh, unless the nitrogen levels in our waters decrease. Um, and as I said, the measures do need to be targeted in the right place to make those improvements. So as we call for today, full implementation of the Nitrates Action Programme. It's our main uh, legislative tool for delivering on agriculture on the compliance side. And obviously there's a lot of work in terms of engagement and voluntary measures with, with agriculture and with farmers and lots of, lots of work going on. Um, Ishk Aaron, we're really calling for them to prioritise the investment in those areas where wastewater is impacting on water quality. And as the Minister spoke about the River Basin Management Plan, it's not to forget that there are other pressures on other sectors uh, all involved and all need action uh, in order to deliver the water quality improvements that we need. So uh, thanks very much for listening. The reports are always, as always, available on our website and water quality data is available on catchments.ie. So thanks very much.